the Lord. If you are ready for the Bible story, I said, Praise the Lord. I heartily welcome everyone to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that God will reward your faithfulness in serving the Lord and coming to the study every time. I thought somebody will say amen to that. And for those who are coming for the first time, we love you, we welcome you, we appreciate your coming. Please keep coming. And the Lord's blessings will enrich your life and your family in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We bless your name for your people, our workers, our leaders, our members, our invitees, everyone. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you bless us in the study of your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that every one of us will receive the Lord who has come to bless us. That none of us will turn him away in Jesus' name. And we pray that as we receive him in all his fullness, the blessing will belong to everyone. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We've been studying from the gospel according to St. Mark. And we have gone from chapter 1 to chapter 11. Now we're coming to chapter 12. Today we're in Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 1 all through to verse 12. Please follow along as we read together. And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set an edge about it and digged a place for the wine press and built a tower and let it out to Osman men and went into a far country. And at the season is sent to the Osman men, a servant, that he might receive from the husband men of the fruits of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. In verse 4, and again, he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head. And sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husband men saw, said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and inheritance shall be ours. And he took him, and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husband men, and will give the vineyard to others. And have ye not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the hedge of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hand, to lay hold on him, but they feared the people. Listen to this, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. The Lord is uh, coming to almost the close of his earthly ministry. He's been ministering to them about three and a half years now, and this is actually the last week he'll be spending with them. Because a few days from now, they'll take him, they'll crucify him, and they will say, let's forget about him, get rid of him. But Jesus Christ continued ministering to them, 
And in this parable, he spoke about the vineyard. And he spoke about the husbandmen. He spoke about the servants that were sent to get the fruit from the husbandmen. And he spoke about their attitude, their action, what they did to those servants. They beat some and they killed some. They killed others. But now he said that the husbandman, the owner of the vineyard, had one person still to sin. His own son is well beloved. And he sent him, and when he saw him, they said, This is the heir. This is the one to inherit the whole vineyard. We hate him. We're going to kill him and get rid of him. And they killed him. And then Jesus said in the parable, What do you think will happen to those husband men? Those husband men are actually cultivators. They were cultivating the vineyard for the owner. He said he will miserably destroy and kill those husband men. He'll bring judgment on them. And then Jesus concluded by saying, Have you ever read the stone that is the cornerstone rejected of the builders has become the head of the house? What's the parable all about? It's about the rejection of the children of Israel. Christ brought the gospel. Christ brought the word. Christ brought salvation. Christ brought the message from the Heavenly Father. But they rejected him. But not only that, they had been rejecting other servants, other prophets, other preachers, other priests before his time. And so as we look at the passage we are looking at today, the topic is man's rejection of the divinely appointed cornerstone. Man's rejection of the divinely appointed cornerstone. He, Christ, is the cornerstone. He is the Son of God. And he is the one, the final word from God the Father that is sent unto them the children of Israel. They rejected him. In a few days, they were going to crucify and kill him. As we look at the whole parable, the owner of the vineyard is God himself. Is the creator, is the lover of the souls of the children of Israel and of the rest of the world. He expected that from the vineyard, fruit will come. The vineyard is the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, instead of bringing forth fruit, they search on the fruit, they wanted to seize the vineyard and the whole thing from the Father, from God, the owner. These Osman men were the people tending the vineyard, taking care of the vineyard. They were the cultivators. Those Osman men, you refer to them as the leaders, religious leaders of Israel. They were the people to teach the people. They were the people to tell them what fruit they should bring back to God. And the serpents is saying to them, asking for fruit, telling them, amend your ways, telling them, take care of the thing the way they ought to be. They were the prophets of God throughout the history of the children of Israel. And of course, you know, the final one that came, the son is well beloved. His name is Jesus. He said, although they've done all these to the servants, the prophets, I'm going to send one final person. And then they will reverence him, respect him, honor him, accept him, believe him. But no, they didn't. They killed him. The message again, man's rejection of the divinely appointed cornerstone. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the picture and recollection of the cultivator's savagery. Their savagery, their cruelty. The violence, the evil behavior, the picture, and the recollection of the cultivator's savagery. Point number two, the prophecy 
of the rejection of the cornerstone. It wasn't anything strange. It didn't take a Christ by surprise because it had been prophesied before this time that this cornerstone they will reject. The Son of God, they will reject. The Messiah, they will reject. They'll push him away. They'll turn him away and they will kill him. Point number two, the prophecy of the rejection of the cornerstone. Point number three, the punishment and retribution for the condemned stewards. The punishment and the retribution for the condemned stewards. Let's come to point number one. Tell me number one over there. Tell me number one over there. I'm waiting for you. God bless you. The picture and the recollection of the cultivator savagery. And that's uh, for Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. We're ready to ready. Let's, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, Matthew telling us about the same theme. Actually, this parable was recorded by Matthew, by Mark, and by Luke. I want to see some shades of meaning and some shades of details in what Matthew and Luke also wrote about. We're looking at it from Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, reading from verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder, that's representing God now, which planted a vineyard and edged it round about, and dig the wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out to husband men, and when and went into a far country. You see the story, you see the parable. The Almighty God is the creator of all men and especially the children of Israel. And he planted them like a vineyard. He edged them round about. He protected them. It's like when you build, when you have a farm and then you have a fence around the farm. And he dig the wine press so that all the fruits of the vineyard, the vines, they will bring them into the press and they will match them and get the fruit of, uh, of the vine from it. And he built a tower. The tower he built is so that watchmen can go up that tower and look around and watch so that all the people will be secured and the farm itself will be secured. And now he let it to Osman men. He let it to Osman men. It wasn't their property. It wasn't uh, that he wanted them to take ownership, saying, the nation belongs to me, the church belongs to me, the people belong to me. No, he lent it out to them and he went into a far country. The thing is, he wasn't there physically present to them. God remains in heaven and the people taking care of the vineyard, the religious life of the people, teaching the word of God, preaching the word of God, encouraging the people and telling them to bring fruit unto the Lord. They were here on earth. Look at verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, the saint is servants to the husband men. He sent his servants. He sent his prophets. He demanded that they will give fruit unto them and then to God, but that they might receive the fruits of it. Look at verse 35. And the husband men took the servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. As you read the story of the children of Israel, in the Old Testament, you will know that this is a recollection of what the children of Israel did to their prophets, to the messengers of God, to the servants of God. In verse 36, again the saints, other servants, more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. You know, you know that all the period of the various kings, there are various prophets, the prophet Elijah, and then prophet Elisha, 
and later you have uh, all the other prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah. After them, you have uh, people like Daniel, you have Ezekiel. After them, you have Hosea, you have you know, all those uh, people. Amos as well. Again, the saints, other servants unto them. But last of all, the saints, them, his son, seeing they will reverence my son. Seeing they will reverence my son. But when the husband men saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize his vineyard. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard comes, what will he do unto those husband men? He wanted them to think about their lives. He wanted them to think about their action. And he wanted an answer from them. See the story I'm telling you. And see the thing that happened. And see what they did eventually to the son of the master, the son of the one, the householder. Look at the answer they gave themselves, verse 41. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. They themselves said, those husband men, those cultivators that did like that to the servants of the householder and eventually did like that to the son of the householder, they are wicked men. And therefore the marriage be miserably destroyed and they were let out his vineyard unto other husband men, which shall render him the fruits of the of the at their season and let's look at some 80 so we can have scriptural understanding of what the vineyard is and then we get the flow of the story and the parable that jesus gave we're looking at some 80 and i'm reading from verse 8 some 80 verse 8 thou hast brought a vine out of egypt you see that he's talking about Israel. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. You cast out all the Canaanites, all the Jebusites, all the Hivites, all the Hittites, and you planted the children of Israel in the promised land. Thou prepares room before it, and deeds cause it to take deep root, and it fills the land. The hills were covered. Was shadow with the shadow of it, and the bows thereof were like the goodly cedars. Look at verse 11. She sent out her bows unto the sea and her branches unto the river. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, the vineyard which thy right hand has planted, and the branch that thou made strong for thyself. You see, the vineyard, that's the children of Israel, and the Lord planted them himself. And this passage says, you planted them, and you strengthened them, made them strong for thyself. They were to bring fruit unto God. Look at verse 16. It is burnt or fire. It is caught down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. The people taking care of them did not take care very well. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. You hear the Lord himself now talking about the vineyard. And he says, he tells us who the vineyard actually represents. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved touching concerning his vineyard. His vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. And he faced it. And he gathered out the stones thereof, 
and planted it with the choicest of vine. And he built a tower in the midst of it. And he also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. You see that Jesus Christ was referring to this. And these the leaders of Israel, they knew that the land of Israel, the people of Israel, they actually make up the vineyard. Look at verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, my vineyard, they belong to God. What could have been done? More to my vineyard that I have not done in it. Wherefore, when I looked that it could bring, it should bring forth graves, uh, brought it forth wild graves. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the edge thereof. I'll take the protection away thereof. What does that mean? The protection of the Lord, the security of the Lord. He said they will take it away. So the Assyrians will come. There will be no hindrance. They will take them away. So the Babylonians will come. When he takes the hedge of protection away, they will carry the children of Israel, the, the, the children of Judah. They will carry them away. So that the Middle Persian will come. And they will carry them away. They will oppress them. He says, I will take away the egg thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break, and break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned, nor deed, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. Look at this now. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The man of Judah is pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold oppression, and for righteousness, but behold a crime. You will see what Jesus Christ was saying then. As you look at the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ, it tells us, number one, something about God himself. Number two, something about the servants and about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it tells us something about all men everywhere. Let's think about that. Number one, what does the parable talk or say about God? That God is generous. The generosity of God. That he made the, uh, the vineyard and he put those uh, servants there. And he left it in their hand. Take care of it. When the time of fruit comes, I will send my servants and uh, they will get the fruit. Number two, we see the trust of God in the cultivators. He trusted them. He wasn't staying there physically, looking over their shoulders. He trusted them that they will do the right thing. Number three, we see the patience of God. He sent some servants. They beat those servants. They stoned some of them. They killed some of them. He did not bring judgment immediately. He sent other servants again. And they did the same thing. He said, I'll not give up on them. The patience of God. And then they now were to kill a son. But we we'll see number four, the ultimate judgment of God. As we think about our lives, isn't that what the Lord has done? Number one is generosity towards us. He has brought us to this world. He has given us life. He has given us breath. He even gives us the Bible. He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us grace. He has given us everything we need so that we will live a life that is pleasing to Him and will render the fruit unto Him and eventually go to live with Him in heaven. The generosity of God toward you, toward me, toward everyone. Number two, the trust of God. The Lord has trusted us. He gave us a life. He gave us a calling. He gave us a ministry. He gave us what to do. 
and he's not, you know, looking over our shoulders and then beating us and chastising us every time we make a wrong step. He's been patient with us. But then eventually there's going to be the ultimate judgment of God. But number two, it reveals something about Jesus Christ. I want you to think about Jesus Christ now, giving this parable. Number one, Jesus Christ was courageous and bold. He knew that these people were going to kill him. He knew that crucifixion was coming. He knew that within that week, at the end of that week, they will betray him. Somebody will betray him. Jonas Iscariot. They will arrest him and they'll take him to be crucified. And he looked at those persecutors and the people that were going to kill him straight, face to face. And he told them this parable. He didn't miss words. He said, last of all, this is your last chance, you leaders of Israel. His son is well beloved. He's saying to you now, and you will kill him. And guess what's going to happen to you? He will miserably destroy those people. We see the courage of the Lord Jesus Christ there. And we are followers of Christ, we are believers and Christians. We should have the same courage. You see, there are some people, they even run when nobody is pursuing them. And they imagine somebody hates me, somebody is after me, somebody is going to knock me, and there's nobody knocking them. There's nobody that is doing anything against them. It may be a mistake happened somewhere, a mistake happened another way. They take the mistake to be intentional, a plan of the people that want to destroy them. And because of that, they are shaking. They cannot tell the truth. Once again, I want to remind you, nobody will take your life. Nobody will ruin your life. Jesus was courageous even in the midst of that difficulty. And he has passed that courage to us. You will be courageous in Jesus' name. He wants those, those people that were the cultivators of the vineyard of the Lord. He wants them of their savagery and of the judgment that will come upon them. Number two, Jesus distinguished himself. Can you see that he made a difference between the servants and those other people? They killed some, they beat some, they stoned them. And then he said, the householders said, at the last I will send my well-beloved son. Which means that Jesus is greater than a prophet. Jesus is higher than all those other people. He is distinguished from them. Number three, he knew the purpose of his death. He knew the purpose of his death, the cross. And he knew he was going to die, but he will come back. And when he comes back, what will he do to those cultivators, husband men? He will destroy them. The, the, par the parable is very clear. Also, it tells us that, G that uh, God himself is going to bring a judgment upon the people that reject the cornerstone. That's why he gave the final thing there, that the cornerstone that was rejected will become the hedge of the corner. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm going to come back. Don't you think that killing him, don't you think that crucifying him will be the end of Christ? He will come again and he will be the edge of the corner. But now the Bible tells us something about man in general. What does, that, what does he tell us about man? Man wants independence from God. He doesn't want to render any account. You're giving me life, leave me alone. You give me grace, leave me alone. You give me salvation, leave me alone. You give me your word, leave me alone. They prefer that God will stay far away and never challenge them about what he has given to them. Number two, men think the owner is too far away and they despise his servants. While they are despising the servants of God, they don't think that God can do anything to them because they don't see God near. They don't feel God near. They only see those servants and then those servants are saying, I made your way. 
Make right your life. Repent of your sin. Bring forth fruit, meat unto repentance. But because they think God is so far away, the owner is so far away, they despise the servants and they, make, they get rid of them. Number three, most men reject Christ. Most men reject the chief cornerstone and they build their lives on principles not based on the word of God. They have no reference to the cornerstone. They have no reference to Christ. They have no reference to the one that the Almighty God has said. They build their own lives independent of God. Number four, we learn that the day of reckoning will definitely come. The day of judgment will definitely come, and every man will give account of himself unto God. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2 and see what the prophet said about the vineyard of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 21. Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then had thou turned unto, the, unto me into a degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me. The Lord is saying, everything to get you saved is available. Everything to get you pure, holy, and sanctified, everything is available. And the word of God comes to you all the time. I'm sending my prophets unto you. How is he to have turned a degenerate vine unto me? We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And here we're reading from verse 4. Jeremiah 25, reading from verse 4. And the Lord has sent unto, has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, all those servants that came asking for fruit on behalf of God, those are the prophets. The Lord has sent unto you all the servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened and inclined your ear to hear. Look at verse 5. The search turn ye again now everyone from his evil way and from his evil doings bring forth the fruit of repentance and the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of redemption and it says and dwell in the land that the lord had given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever but look at chapter 35 of jeremiah jeremiah chapter 35 and we're reading here from verse 15, Jeremiah 35, reading from verse 15, I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, the servants that Jesus referred to in the parable, they're the prophets of God. They stoned some of them. They killed some of them. They pushed them away. They said, don't talk to us about God. Don't talk to us about righteousness. Don't talk to us about bringing forth fruit. We're not going to bring forth any fruit unto God. I, I have sent unto you my, all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now, every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not at other gods to serve them and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you unto your fathers but ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me you see those people instead of listening to the Lord they said no we're not going to listen to the Lord we're going to go our own way and we will not bring fruit unto the Lord Jeremiah chapter 44 and I'm reading from verse 4 Jeremiah chapter 44 reading from verse 4 how be it I sent unto you all my servants the prophets you see every time it says my servants who are those servants? The prophets. It says, How be it? I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, O oh, do not this abominable sin that I hate. 
do not these abominable things that I hate. And yet, that's exactly what he did in Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 7. In Zechariah chapter 7, I'm reading here from verse... Uh, let's get there. Zechariah chapter 7. We're reading from verse 9. In verse 9, it says, Thus speaketh the Lord of all, saying, Execute judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Look at verse 11. But they refused to hack him. He sent his sermons to them. He sent the prophets to them. Don't do evil and make your ways repent and bring forth fruit unto God. Make God happy by your life, by your character, by your response to the word of God. See how much he has done for you. And see the vineyard he puts in your hand. But they refused not in verse 11. They refused to hack in and they pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Very hard, uncircumcised, unsaved, unregenerate, reprobate, lest they should hear the law and the words which are which the lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets therefore came a great trust from the lord of hosts therefore in verse 13 it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear so they cried and i will not hear says the lord of hosts it says judgment eventually will come. Uh, let's come to Matthew now, New Testament, Matthew chapter 23. Eventually see what happened to them because of their being adamant and because of their constant rejection and because of the evil of their hand. Matthew chapter 23 verse, 20, verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, and wise men and scribes and some of them he shall kill and crucify and some of them he shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city you think that uh, you know those uh, servants of god they did any evil to them no not at all all they wanted was that they will come to God, they'll walk in the narrow path, they'll live a holy life, they will get ready for heaven. That's all they were saying. And then it says in verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed from upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, the son of Zechariah, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all this thing shall come to pass upon this generation. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Look at what Jesus is saying now, is direct now, is giving us a proper interpretation now of all those servants that killed, of all the um, husband men that killed the servants, and they're going to kill the Son of God. He said, that's what you've done. The prophets of God, you have stoned, you have abused, you have, uh, you have assaulted, and you have destroyed, and you have stoned them that are saints unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not, and ye would not. I brought salvation, and ye would not receive. I brought conversion, I brought a new life, but you will not receive. I brought the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, but you will not, you will not accept. Look at verse 38. Behold, your house is led unto you 
desolate. The Lord was telling them he was going to abandon Israel. He was going to abandon that nation. Look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. We're reading from verse 34. In Luke chapter 13, verse 34, here it tells us, So Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as the hen does gather, have brood under her wings, and ye would not. There are some people that say that, you know, God will save who he will save. And those people must be saved. They are eternally uh, marked down, elected, predestinated, that they must be saved. No. Look at this. Jesus said, I would have saved them. I would have converted them. I would have healed them. I would have brought them under my secure wings of protection spiritually. But they would not. And because they would not, I leave their house to them desolate. Salvation is available. Salvation is free. But if anybody rejects that salvation, God cannot force the salvation on anyone. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 15. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 15. This is after Christ died. It's after the day of Pentecost, and this is after the gospel was made clear, made plain to everybody. Still see what they did, and still see the continuation. It says in verse 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Here is Paul the Apostle, and he's saying they have not changed. The steel just like that. They both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and they persecuted us. We're apostles, we're preaching the word to them, we love them, we do everything at night and day laboring that they will be saved. Instead of getting saved, they persecuted us. They please not God, they are contrary to all men. Look at verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. They are not saved, they are not sanctified, they are not yielded to the Lord, and we want to go to the Gentiles. Okay, you don't want salvation, we're going to the Gentiles. They forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Let's come back to Mark now. Mark chapter 12 and see that Jesus Christ did not leave them in doubt as to the result of their action and as to the prophecy that went on before they did what they did. We're coming to Mark chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 9 all through to verse 11. Mark chapter 12 reading from verse 9. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the Osman men and will give the vineyard to or unto others. What does that mean? Now the vineyard, you understand, they are the house of Israel. They are the people God has created. He sent servants that they will talk to the people and preach to the people. And these religious leaders in the synagogue, the religious leaders in the temple, he honored them. He gave them privilege that they will speak to the people in the days of Jesus. They will open the door of the temple and Jesus will bring salvation to those people. They close the door. And he cast out the people that will preach to them. You remember that blind, uh, that person that was born blind? He said, this is Christ. If he's not of God, he could do nothing. They say, are you teaching us? You were born blind 
and you're teaching us and they cast him out of the temple and that's what jesus said here he will not give the privilege of preaching to other people that's why he gave the prayer to the apostles that's why he gave the privilege to people like philip and all the people that preach the word of god even to paul the apostle he took that privilege away from them because they'll not make use of the privilege for the purpose they were given the privilege look at verse 10 have you not read the scripture the stone which the builders rejected is become the hedge of the corner this is the lord's doing it is marvelous in our eyes point number two the prophecy of the rejection of the cornerstone the prophecy of the rejection of the cornerstone it had been prophesied that's why jesus christ was not taken by surprise you see when something happens to us and we don't know how could this happen and then we're sad we're depressed we're discouraged we don't go back to the scriptures to say okay what does the bible say the Bible said this, this, and this, that this will happen. And it is happening according to the plan of God. Think about what happened to Jesus Christ. There was a Judas Iscariot that betrayed him. He wasn't taken by surprise. He knew from Scripture that will happen. And then they rejected him. They said, the way was him. We don't want him. If something like that happens to us, and we didn't know that will happen, we think everybody is going to be a friend. Everybody is going to assist. Everybody is going to lift us up. And then we're disappointed. We'll be sorrowful. We'll be dejected. The rejection will bring dejection. But you know, Jesus was not surprised at all. Whatever happens, God knew it will happen. And God has a solution for everything that happens in your life. Are you there? I said God has a solution for everything that will happen in your life. You know, because we are human beings, we didn't know that will happen, so we didn't make any preparation should in case that thing happens. But you know, Jesus Christ, he knew. I pray you will know. Look at Psalm 118, Psalm 118. He asked them, have you not read, have you not read, have you not read? He asked them, in Psalm 118, I'm reading from verse 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. He's talking about his death. They refused him. They rejected him. Away with him, crucify him. But after that death is going to rise up again because he's still going to come back to become the hedge of the corner whatever bad things has happened now that's not the end of your life you will rise again you will get up again you will move on again in jesus name this is the lord's doing it is marvelous in our eyes when you see what the lord will do and he'll bring something positive out of, out of that negative thing in your life it will be marvelous in your eyes we're looking at isaiah chapter 28 isaiah chapter 28 and here we're reading from verse 16 isaiah chapter 28 reading from verse 16 it tells us in verse 16 therefore thus says the lord god behold i lay in zion a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make haste that's uh, spoken about the lord jesus christ even before he came and god said i lay in zion a stone a foundation a chief cornerstone and there are people who are going to believe in him and all of us who believe in him we will not be ashamed you will not be ashamed look at acts chapter 4 acts chapter 4 the cornerstone the prophecy concerning the rejection of that cornerstone acts chapter 4 we're reading from verse 11 
This is the stone which was set at north of you builders, which has become the hedge of the corner. You see that? The apostles eventually knew that what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ was not an accident. No accident in your life. No accident in my life. No accident in your family. God will get glory out of everything in Jesus' name. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, the chief cornerstone. They rejected him, but it's now become the hedge of the corner. In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Very clear, very clear. It's been prophesied, and everything that happened to the Lord Jesus Christ happened according to prophecy. It was written, it was written. What is written concerning him was all fulfilled in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, we're reading from, let's, let's back up to verse 7. First Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 7. Unto you therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the hedge of the corner. You see it, Old Testament and New Testament, and it refers to Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But she a chosen generation. Amen. A royal priesthood. Amen. And holy nation. Amen. A peculiar people. You lost your amen there. A peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called you. Has he called you? I said, has he called you? Everything he had in mind before he called you, everything will be fulfilled. Don't worry, don't mind about what might happen today or what might happen last week, or what might happen last month, the place is taking you to, and the reason for which he called you must be fulfilled, will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He will fulfill it. We're coming back to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We're looking at uh, verse uh, 12 now. Mark chapter 12. We're reading now from verse, um, we're reading from verse 12. In verse 12, and they sought to lay on him, to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their way. This is point number three now. In point number three, the punishment and retribution for the condemned stewards. He had already told them, if you turn back to verse seven, but those husband men said among themselves, they said the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And he took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husband men and will give the vineyard to others. Uh, let, let's look at a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 21. And we understand what Jesus Christ implied in the parable. 
that there will be punishment for those that were going to take Jesus. They were going to crucify him. Well, are we surprised? And should they be surprised? They themselves said, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us. Look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 40. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husband men? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. They refer to as wicked men. They themselves refer to themselves as wicked men. And will let out his vineyard unto other husband men which shall render the fruit in their season. And they prophesied and they predicted that judgment will come. Look at verse 42. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you that's a great punishment. The people that had the kingdom of God and the people that took care of the kingdom of God, the kingdom is now taking away from them and giving to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Whosoever, high priest or chief priest, whosoever, all those rulers in Israel that will fall on that stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, his parable, they perceived that he spake of them. And instead of repenting that, okay, this parable is concerning us. And let us examine the work of our hand. Let us see what we are doing. Our fathers killed the prophets. And now here is the Son of God. Here is the Messiah. Look at all his miracles. Look at the evidence that he has given us that he is the Son of God. What are we trying to do? You want to kill a person like this and look at this parable. I think it's time to repent. No, instead of repenting, verse 46, And when they saw to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Instead of repenting, all they wanted to do was to get rid of him. Let's look at Luke. In Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20, we're reading here from verse 15. Luke chapter 20, we're reading from verse 15. It says in verse 15, So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husband men and shall give the vineyard to others they will lose their privilege and he was telling these uh, israelites and these rulers of the synagogue you're about to lose your privilege you're about to lose your high position you're about to lose all the good good things you have been doing and the lord has made you a mouthpiece because of the way you are living and you will not repent he will miserably destroy all of them and then he will give the vineyard to others and when they heard it they said god forbid they didn't change they said god forbid they didn't repent they said god forbid all the evil they wanted to do they still continue plat uh, planning and plotting they only said god forbid but judgment will come if sinners do not repent look at verse 19 and the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour sought to lay hands on him immediately after the parable. And they understood the parable. You will think that immediately after the message, they'll be sober. They'll be sorry about what they have been trying to do. They will turn. They will repent. No, it says immediately they wanted to lay hands on him, but they feared the people. For they perceived that he had spoken 
this parable against them. Have you found that, you know, anybody like that today? They come to the service, they come to hear the word of God, and the word of God is given. And then they perceive, what's he talking like that? What's he telling me to repent? He has me in mind. He's pointing my direction. Why is he talking to me like that? No, I will not repent. And they want to do evil against the preacher that loves their soul, that doesn't want them to perish. Thank God you are not like that. I say, thank God we are not like that. When the word comes to you, when the message comes, there is but one thing to do, just obey, just obey. We're coming to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 9. Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down, hewn down, and cast into the fire. You will not be cast into the fire. I will not be cast into the fire. We will not perish in Jesus' name. The Lord doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to repent. He wants everyone to come to know the Lord. But only those people that reject to the final day, then they miss the love of God. Not that God did not love them. Not that God did not want to save them. They are the people that make the choice. You will make a right choice in Jesus' name. John chapter 3, reading from verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Those people could have had everlasting life, they could have received salvation, but they, they shunned that salvation and they cast away the salvation from them and they cast the Savior away from them. That the reason they perished, I will not perish. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Don't let anyone be like the Pharisees. Don't let anyone be like those uh, chief priests. They knew the parable was coming to them directly. It was spoken to them. They heard, instead of returning, instead of repenting and getting saved, they plotted more evil. Evil will not be in your heart. Evil will not be in your hand. Evil will not be in your life in Jesus' name. Therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should not let, let them sleep. If somebody hears the word and he gets angry, if somebody hears the word and he's saying, ah, he's talking about me, he's talking about me, and I'm going to plan, I'm going to plot to destroy him, He's letting the word of God sleep away from him. But the word of God will not sleep away from us. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect the direct message of Jesus Christ to our hearts? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? This word will not slip away from us. It will not slip away from you. The word of salvation will not slip away from you. Of sanctification will not slip away from you. Every sin the Lord decided and planned that the word will do in your life, it will do in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. 
Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you should see shall come short of it. Those Pharisees, those Sadducees, and those uh, doctors of the law, they, 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 want, they, fall, they fell short of it. The word came to them. It did not mix with faith in their heart. It mixed with anger in their heart, bitterness in their heart. It mixed with uh, evil plot and planning in their hearts. They perished, we will not perish. Look at verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, nor be mixed with faith in them that had it. We shall allow the word of God to mix with faith in our hearts and not say, He's speaking against me, He's talking about me, and because He's talking to me, I hate Him, I don't like Him. No, He's not talking against you. He wants you to have the free salvation of the Lord and the free blessings of the Lord. You'll be blessed in Jesus' name. In First Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 9, uh, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us what? Look at the action of God, how long suffering he was. He planted that vineyard, he gave to those husband men, and then he sent his servants, the prophets. They killed them, he sent others, they stoned them, he sent others. They beat them. He sent others. He kept on sending them. He was long suffering. Eventually, he said, I will send my only begotten son. They will reverence him, they will respect him, and they will receive the message of life and salvation is bringing. But unfortunately, they did not. I will. I said, I will. It says, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. All shall come to repentance. I welcome you once again to our Bible study. You will not perish. Eternal life will be yours. He has planted us as a vineyard, and he has sent his minister, his preacher to us, so that we will bring forth fruit. My brother there, you'll bring forth fruit. My dear sister there, you'll bring forth fruit. Fruit of righteousness, fruit of salvation, fruit of sanctification, fruit of holiness. And if there is any grace we need, Christ has brought grace unto us. We will have abundant grace in Jesus' name. You will profit the kingdom of God. What are you? You'll be a prophet in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we've heard your word. We're not going to do like those husband men, like those cultivators that misused and misapplied the word. And they had plot and they had evil in their hearts and they did evil. We will not do evil, we'll, not, we'll do good for the word they are sent unto us. Salvation is ours, claim it. Sanctification is ours, claim it. Holiness is ours and the fruit of the spirit is ours the lord will make it abundantly and to bear fruit in your life in jesus name